Hi, I'm Megha Rawal, a scientist at ARUP Laboratories, and today I'll be discussing detection of measles using real-time PCR and how this assay provides critical advantages such as speed, accuracy, and scalability in controlling measles outbreaks. So measles, as we know, is a highly contagious pathogen. It can be fatal, but is preventable with vaccination. And despite being eliminated in the United States in early 2000, measles remain a concern due to increasing number of cases in recent years. In 2024, a total of 285 measles cases were reported across multiple states. And as shown in the map here, Minnesota and Illinois reporting the highest case numbers. So far into 2025, 164 cases have been documented across nine different states, and with uh, 146 of them being identified in South Plains region of Texas. And majority of these cases occurred in unvaccinated individuals. Tragically, this has resulted in the first confirmed measles-related infant death in a decade. And on that note, one thing I'd like to highlight is that misinformation and distrust of vaccine can be just as contagious as a disease itself. And due to declining vaccination rates in certain communities and through imported cases, measles outbreaks continues to pose a threat to public health. This brings me to the importance of rapid and accurate diagnostic methods for measles detection. So measles by real-time PCR offers rapid turnaround time and accurate identification of cases. This enables quicker isolation and treatment of the infected individuals, thereby in preventing the spread of the virus. Now let's start with a brief over overview of measles. So as I mentioned, it's a highly contagious RNA virus. The symptoms are characterized by fever, cough, conjunctivitis, and a distinctive rash. The measles genome is relatively small, about 16 kilobases in length. The genome encodes six structural proteins and two non-structural proteins. So this, right, this on the right is a schematic representation of uh, the measles genome. Two main targets for diagnostic assays are the nucleoprotein gene or the N gene. So the N gene encodes nucle nucleocapsid protein shown here in pink. And these are the key components for viral replication and assembly. And the other target is hemagglutinin gene or the H gene. These encode the H protein and they are these T-like structures, and they help in attachment of viral particle to the host cells. Both of these genes are highly conserved across different measles strains, and they play a critical role in viral replication, making them an ideal target for diagnostic assays. Now, here is a brief uh, overview of the measles assay. So this, so this assay is a rapid multiplex real-time PCR targeting the nucleoprotein gene of the measles virus. And one of the key advantages of this assay is its ability to detect and differentiate between the measles vaccine and wild-type strains in a single test. Primers and probes used in this assay are adapted from methods developed by Hummel, Roy, and their colleagues. And these sequences are also employed by CDC and WHO for their measles detection assay. Now, initial assessment and development was done using RNA transcripts derived from five synthetic plasmids containing portions of the N gene from five different measles strains. These strains were vaccine B3, D4, D8, and H1. And the validation work entailed testing of uh, respiratory swabs, urine specimens, and several clinically relevant pathogens. And we'll talk more about the validation results later in the presentation. Now, one thing I'd like to highlight is that this assay was validated on the Hologic Panther Fusion System. 
So the use of this platform is particularly advantageous because it fa facilitates easier scalability. The thing is, we do not expect consistently high number of measles cases. However, in the event of an outbreak, the Panther Fusion system allows for rapid scaling up to accommodate larger number of samples, ensuring timely and effective testing. And not only that, the Panther Fusion system has this off-board application called MyAccess software. So this software is a really versatile software. It allows users to create custom open access protocol as well as analyze data with user-defined result interpretation settings. And we'll talk more about this in the next few minutes. Now let's dive deeper into the development work. So two sets of primers and probes used in this assay were MEV primers, pro primers and probe. So this set is specific to all types of measles virus. It detects all measles subtypes and the signal is detected in the hex channel, whereas the other set is MEVA primers and probe. So these are specific for the vaccine genotype and the signal is detected in the FAM channel. This table right here shows uh, sequences of primers and probes used in this assay. And I quickly wanna go over the probes used in the assay. So if you look at MEVA probe, it has coupled nucleotides followed by a plus sign. So these are called locked nucleotide bases. So what LNA modification does is it enhances specificity by increasing binding affinity of probe to its target. And if you look at MEV probe, it has Zen in it. So Zen is an internal quencher and it improves probe's performance by reducing the background fluorescence. Now this image below here shows binding region of MEVA probe within the N gene of vaccine and B3 strains. So the probe has 100% match with the vaccine strain, whereas has a single nucleotide mismatch at this boxed region right here. We see T in vaccine versus G in the wild type strain. And we'll see how this mismatch correlates to one of the challenges we encountered during the development in our next slide. So this plot right here shows dilution series of uh, vaccine and wild type strains RNA transcripts in the FAM channel. Now, if you recall from the slide before, we should only be seeing vaccine strain signal in the FAM channel. However, we also see these flatter looking curves around the baseline, and these are B3 curves. And this cross reactivity is likely due to the MEVA probe having a single nucleotide mismatch with the wild type strain, leading to some degree of nonspecific binding. So to resolve this issue, we have identified two main approaches. First approach is adjusting curb correction parameters on MyAccess software, and approach two is further optimizing the assay conditions. Now let's take a closer look at our first approach. So as I mentioned, MyAccess is a highly flexible software. It allows users to integrate custom analysis parameters directly into the protocol. And whenever samples are tested using that protocol, the analysis is automatically performed based on the predefined settings. And not only that, the software also allows for retrospective analysis of past data, meaning when um, meeting users with um, the existing data can adjust the analysis parameters according to their needs, to their desired configuration, and analyze the data in different light. So on the right is a snapshot of um, analysis parameters on the MyAccess software. As I mentioned, users can plug and chug and play with these uh, different criteria depending on the need. 
but for our purpose, adjusting a baseline correction slope limit of the FAM channel to 150 helped us in properly setting the threshold value as well as reducing those that crosstalk we saw around the FAM baseline. Now again, this plot right here is the same set of data we saw earlier just analyzed with uh, different analysis settings. So in this case, um, the adjusted baseline correction slope limit was integrated into the protocol and the data was analyzed. So as you can see, fine tuning of uh, the analysis parameters, we were able to significantly reduce that flatter looking curve around the baseline and we only were able to detect vaccine strain in the FAM channel. And although adjusting of analysis settings worked very well and significantly reduced the false positive curve, we wanted to further optimize the assay and see how that works. For our second approach, PCR components as well as cycling conditions were fine-tuned to determine the optimal assay conditions. And out of all the tested conditions, tweaking of MEVA primers and probe concentration in combination with the annealing temperature of 60C aided in achieving the optimal results. Now, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that when samples were run under the optimal conditions, it did not require adjustment of curve correction parameters that we discussed in our first approach. So this plot right here, again, is the same set of samples uh, run under the optimized assay conditions. And with the optimized assay conditions, the vaccine strain was exclusively detected in the FAM channel, whereas uh, there was no signal from B3 strain. We don't see those like funky looking curves around the baseline. So this plot right here shows dilution series of RNA transcripts of vaccine and wild type strains tested under the optimal assay conditions. And as you can see, vaccine strain was exclusively detected in the FAM channel, and we don't see those flatter looking curves around the baseline anymore. Now, although we had a couple challenges in the FAM channel, our uh, signal in the HEX channel before optimization and after optimization remained pretty consistent. So on the left is um, samples um, in the HEX channel before optimization versus on the right is after optimization. As you can see, there's not much difference in the signal. So that was, that was a good news. Overall, comprehensive optimization led to enhanced specificity and improved assay performance. And in order to further confirm the robustness of this assay, high titer RNA transcripts of vaccine and measles uh, while measles strains were tested. And as expected, vaccine strain was exclusively detected in the FAM channel while all the tested wild type strains were correctly identified in the HEX channel. So this run confirmed that the optimized conditions effectively distinguished between vaccine and wild type strains even at a very high RNA transcripts level. And once the optimized conditions were established, validation work proceeded pretty smoothly. Again, validation was done using respiratory swabs, urine specimen, and, and clinically relevant pathogens. Positive culture material for vaccine and wild type strains were quantified using droplet digital PCR and were used for spiking. So starting off with accuracy, to assess the accuracy of this assay, varying load of vaccine and wild type strains were spiked into swabs and urine samples. And the accuracy results summary is explained in this table here. So the results show we have 100% agreement among vaccine strain spiked samples, as well as um, B3 spiked swab samples, whereas 95% agreement among B3 spiked urine samples. As for negatives, all the tested samples showed negative results. 
for precision, five pool swabs and urine samples were spiked with vaccine and wild type strains at 10 times the limit of detection. These samples were tested in triplicate on the same run for within run precision and on different runs for between run precision. Overall, percent CV was pretty tight, which was less than or equal to 2%. And as for limit of detection, five serial dilutions of quantified measles vaccine and wild type B3 strains were prepared in swabs and urine samples. These dilutions were tested in replicates of six to establish a preliminary LOD, and the limit of detection was confirmed by running 20 replicates at the established LOD. Limit of detection for vaccine strain spike samples was found to be 800 copies per mil, and that for B3 spike samples was 2,500 copies per mil. For specificity, several clinically relevant pathogens as well as other wild-type measles strains obtained from Dr. Relic's lab at Indiana University were tested, and as expected, all the wild-type strains uh, were correctly identified in the HEX channel with no signal in the FAM channel as shown in this table here. And all the Pathogens that were tested for cross-reactivity showed negative results in FAM and HEX channel. Now, before we wrap up, I want to highlight some key points from this presentation. The measles assay allows for rapid detection and differentiation between the measles vaccine and wild-type strains, eliminating the need for sequencing. And we discussed two approaches uh, to take care of uh, the false positive samples. In our first approach, integrating of baseline correction slope limit helped take care of those flatter looking curves near the FAM baseline. And in our second approach, we discussed the optimized assay conditions that yielded the desirable outcome without the adjustment of analysis parameters. And finally, we believe that the implementation of the measles assay on the hologic panther fusion system will significantly improve the turnaround times and enhance our ability to respond quickly to measles outbreaks. Finally, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the members of R&D Infectious Disease Group, the clinical lab team, our collaborator at Indiana University, and the Hologic team. Thank you.